Sahu sir for joining. Uh, Dr. Sahu sir will be joining uh, soon. So this month we have actually uh, chosen to discuss three articles. Uh, one is on uh, you know, Botox injection for fecal urge incontinence. Uh, and second article on pancreatic steatosis as a risk factor for post-TRCP pancreatitis. And the final one on patient safety incidents uh, in the endoscopy unit. So the first article is published by the French group in Lancet Gastroenterology and Hepatology, titled as uh, Interrectal Injections of uh, Botulinum Toxin versus Placebo for the Treatment of Urge Incontinence in Adults, which is called as FI Toxin Study, a double blind a multicenter randomized control phase 3 study. Yeah. So we know that around 8.4% of Americans suffer with fecal incontinence. It can be passive or urge or mixed. Urge incontinence is actually the inability that we, uh, uh, the patients will not be able to withstand an urge to defecate. It is often attributable to anal hypocontractility or to a hypersensitive or hypercontractile rectum. Passive incontinence is an involuntary leakage of the fecal contents without any prior warning. And it is usually because of anal hypotonia or hypersensitive rectum. Many medical and surgical therapies are available, but they are very complicated sometimes. They need re repeated reinterventions, and they can be <clears throat> they need not be available in many of the countries. We know that urologists use the botulinum toxin type A, which is in injected in detrusor muscle uh, in hypercontractile situations when they are suffering with urge incontinence from the of the urine. Uh, basically, the Botox in improves the bl urinary bladder compliance and capacity, and it delays the detrusor. Uh, uh, muscle contraction, disinhibited contractions. So if you see actually the mechanism of action of Botox, uh, it basically inhibits the presynaptic release of the acetylcholine so that acetylcholine is less available in the synapse and there is <coughs> reduced activation of the muscle and uh, reduced contractions. So the aim of the current study is to evaluate the efficacy and safety of the intrarectal uh, Botox injection in adults with urge fecal incontinence in a randomized placebo control trial. Uh, over a period of five years, between 2015 to 2028, French hospitals uh, participated in this study. Uh, patients who are more than 18 years, at least having one episode of urge or incontinence per week for three months, and who had three previous failed therapies uh, uh, were included, and they were allowed to use the standard motility drugs uh, whenever they required it. Patients who had uh, passive uh, fecal incontinence, who had anorectal malformation or tumor, colonic surgeries, IBD, pelvic radiotherapy, rectal prolapse, patients with fecal impaction, any external anal sphincter defects that can be repaired, a rapidly progressive neurological disease, patients who are pregnant, patients who are consuming anticoagulants or anti aggregant uses, patients who had a contraindication to rectoscopy or Botox injections, and previous. Exposure to Botox injection in the past three months were all excluded. The randomization happened 21 to 60 days before the injection, which was named as M-1. Uh, the, the randomization uh, happened with one is to one, uh, in a one, one is to one manner between Botox and placebo. Randomization was further stratified by Cleveland Clinic's severity score for fecal incontinence, either less than 12 or more than 12. The study uh, uh, was a blinded study up to six months. And after six months, uh, both patients as well as the providers are unblinded and patients are unblinded. Uh, and all the willing participants in the Botox, in the placebo group at six months were offered uh, Botox injection. So the intervention consisted of 200 units of Botox EA, uh, which is diluted in 10 ml of saline. And 10 injections of 1 ml each of these uh, aliquots of Botox were taken. And it was inject they were injected submucosally at 11 foci. Basically, if you see this diagram, uh, injection 1, 2, 3, around 5 centimeter above the pectinate line, and uh, 4, 5, 6 injections around 10 centimeters, and 7, 8, 9 at around 15 centimeters above the pectinate line, and injection 10 above this region, and injection 11, if it is still available in the syringe, <clears throat> it is injected around the 5 centimeters. And this injection allowed administration of injection along the entire length of rectum, and uh, Hemi-circumferential injection was done to avoid severe constipation. 0.5 mm uh, mm clerotherapy needle was used. Patients were assessed at M-1, M-0, M-3, M-6 with the demographic data, bubble diaries, Cleveland scores, quality of life questionnaire, 
and the ability to delay uh, or postpone the uh, defecation and adverse events. Anorectal manometry was also done at M minus one, M zero, and M three. At month six, uh, patients questioned about uh, benefits uh, in a self-reported manner, and they were unblinded. And the placebo group was offered Botox if they preferred to do so. <coughs> The primary outcomes were the number of fecal incontinence and urgency episodes per day at three months after um, injection, that is M3 visit, according to 21-day um, uh, bowel diaries. And secondary outcomes were number of uh, fecal incontinence and urgency episodes per day at first month and six months of visits. More than 50% reduction in the bowel frequency uh, uh, urgent incontinence episodes on follow-up. And other uh, uh, scores like uh, Cleveland scores, quality of life scores, and the number of daily bowel movement scores, self-reported the delay to postpone the defecation, and manometry findings, and general impression of patients regarding the efficacy of treatment and improvement in quality of life were all included in the secondary outcome. Safety outcomes and adverse outcomes, adverse events were also recorded. So if you see two, not three patients were screened over five years, hundred of them were randomized into each of the arm, and finally. In the modified intention to treat analysis, 96 patients in the Botox group and 95 patients in the placebo group were included. And at the end of six months, 96 patients and 95 patients were able to be followed up in this uh, <coughs> study. And at the end of uh, six months, the placebo group were offered uh, bot uh, Botox and 73 uh, uh, preferred to get a Botox injection and 69 patients uh, were preferred for uh, were followed up for next six months. So the baseline characters were similar. Female patients were predominantly uh, in the study group. Uh, the mean duration of symptoms were around 90 to 95 months. Uh, around 55% of to 59% of patients had urge incontinence. Majority of patients, more than 40%, they had idiopathic um, fecal incontinence. And more than 70, 60 to 70% of patients used some form of medication in the form of antidiarrheal medications, laxative, biofeedback therapy. And in up to 10, uh, 10 to 20% of patients underwent some form of previous surgery. <clears throat> Coming to the results, to summarize the entire table, uh, if you see the box down, uh, at third month, the daily fecal urgent, urgent incontinence episodes reduced from 1.9 to 0.8 in the Botox group compared to 1.4 to reduction in one episode in the placebo group. And the similar trend was also seen in first month and sixth month. There is greater percentage of patients who had more than 50% reduction in the daily uh, episodes uh, uh, of urge and incontinence and greater percentage proportion of patients could delay the defecation, uh, the defecation process in the Botox group compared to the placebo group. And coming to the quality of life, there is better coping and behavior uh, aspect in the Botox group. <coughs> so Botox was uh, uh, noted to be superior to placebo uh, in this uh, study. Uh, in the form of like there is reduced number of daily fecal uh, urge and incontinence episodes at the follow-up at both first month, third month and sixth month. But however, the manometric findings were similar between both the groups and at sixth month, uh, more patients were satisfied on self-reported questionnaire and asked for a repeated repeat Botox injection, even in the Botox group. So if you see the adverse events, fortunately the serious adverse events are not many. Uh, pneumopathy, UTI, and thyroid nodule and phlebitis were noted. Non-serious adverse events, most common is constipation in up to 40% of patients and other adverse events being abdominal pain, bleeding, anorectal pain, etc. So coming to the discussion, it was shown in this study that intrarectal Botox injection improves fecal urge and, urge and incontinence episodes at third month as well as first and sixth month. The reported adverse events may be due to the technique rather than the actual Botox injection as, as per the author. And uh, probably uh, uh, one of the limitations of this study is that the bowel diaries may have led to some bias in reporting. And there may be underpowering in this study to assess the subgroup analysis among various other subgroups. Uh, my only question is, uh, usually we uh, inject this Botox in intramuscular whether it is ecclesia or detrusor muscle. But here, I didn't understand like why have they have injected in the submucosal, uh, you know, uh, as per plane of the rectum. Yeah. I think Rohit sir, Manoj sir, if you can. Okay, Dr. Chalapati, can you tell 
that manometry done in every patient before including for the study uh, majority of patients they got uh, manometry sir uh, and various findings were reported uh, and uh, barostat measurements were done only in few of the patients because of lack of availability then they have not included the patients with passive uh, incontinence yeah they have not included passive incontinence yes so that indicates the manometry done in every patient prior to inclusion in the study yes yes at minus 1 0 and 3 they have done it okay then then you told some mortality drugs were continued as per requirement yeah true <laughs> patients are allowed to continue lopramide uh, even opioids and all these drugs yeah as per the choice they did not uh, ask the patients to withdraw the uh, motility or anti motility drugs okay yeah. then then the second thing the plus uh, placebo response is also there which is seems to be good yes 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 so what is yes. the explanation for that placebo response uh there are may, many other uh, behavioral and uh, probably it must have acted as a biofeedback therapy also some kind of it uh, you know uh, there is lot of uh, uh, behavioral aspect also component also in this uh, urge incontinence and when patients are allowed to uh, you know um, uh, self report like uh, are they able to delay the fecal uh, you know sensation uh, defecation sensation and about the self reporting of the diary and all there might be some amount of bias uh, in reporting so that could have uh, led to uh, some kind of improvement that is reported even in the placebo group so during follow up the manometry findings are similar in both groups mm mm-hmm. yeah they are similar so that could not be explained uh, with the current uh, study as well as uh, if you compare with the eurodynamic studies uh, in the urology they found like they 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 usually find like there is there will be some improvement in the urodynamic study but here in the anorectal manometry it, it was not found probably because of a uh, complex uh, you know uh, uh, the pathogenic mechanisms not only the local but also some kind of mechanisms in the spinal spinal level as well as cerebral level probably okay in the uh, uh, control group placebo group also constipation is overall around 40 percentage Yes, yes. So it is forty percent. Yes. Yes. How to explain that thing? Plus, if a group also when you are injecting normal saline, hmm hmm. So forty percent is developing constipation. Yeah, they 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 have developed no explanation for. Okay. So so can you can you tell us that in urology also they inject botox for uh, urological incontinence. Hmm hmm. So they inject uh, in the muscle or uh, some. Yeah. they inject in the muscle sir so i found out with the urologist so they say that it is an 18 g needle it goes through the cystoscope and they actually uh, know the muscle that it is that is getting injected into the muscle but here they have given clear images uh, that they are injecting into the submucosa yes uh, they... and they have actually shown a submucosal bleb also bleb, yeah. yes yes so, yeah, they have shown in the picture yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so i little bit i didn't understand because why they have injected yeah. in the submucosa just something like they are doing an emr there and will they will it percolate uh, into the muscle i don't know because even we practice botox in ecclesia we do intramuscular injection Absolutely. not the submucosal injection and the needle that they have used is actually 0.5 mm uh, you know sclerotherapy needle so um, i really don't un- i didn't understand this sub- but still they could find some response uh even in the botox group so it means like it is it may be passively dis- diffusing into the uh, muscle probably the concept is like they are injecting into the nerve ending probably which are more uh, go through the the plexus goes through the submucosa and it is affected there i don't know correct correct so chalpati a couple of comments that uh, regarding manometry and they also did barostat measurement Yeah. they have used modified intention to treat analysis for all other analysis but they have used uh, per protocol analysis for barostat and uh, manometry data so it was not done in all patients second yes, yes. use of lopramide was continued it was not a new thing which was added so these patients were already incontinent on the other drugs so yes, that would have balanced out the results 
it would not have added over and above your effect of particular uh, intervention mm. and uh, the important thing is that at least as a gastroenterologist we don't see that much urge incontinence we are possibly missing because in us data shows that it's pretty common in elderly population but our major group of incontinence are passive incontinence where post childbirth vaginal uh, uh, Poor self delivery and all those where there's injury to pudendal nerves or musculature that leads to uh, this kind of situation. And another important thing, their data showed only response was good in patients more than 70 years of age. So yeah. it becomes a very restricted kind of results in a very subgroup of patients in a mm. particular age group. So maybe generalizability of the results is not there in this study, but it's a it's a it's a good study in that it has been designed well. <laughs> the, the methodology they have used is actually uh, uh, good. Hmm. Yes, sir. So definitely, it is a very rare condition. Uh, definitely, it's a rare condition. Probably, uh, the idea of choosing this article is as as you have said, it's a design uh, that they that. And we are usually not primed to see or evaluate these incontinent patients in a proper way. Probably we need to understand and talk to the patients more to differentiate between a passive and uh, urge incontinence because many of these patients uh, are labeled or wrongly diagnosed as just diarrhea. Right. And uh, that's the reason why these patients are still on majority of anti-motility drugs, uh, you know, prescribed by their primary care physician. And also uh, to understand that Botox is still an option in these patients, uh, like uh, other hypercontractile situations in the use of others. Uh, but definitely it is in a very restricted group of uh, patients. And still there are a lot of unanswered things because it is not converting into a meaningful manometric improvement uh, uh, data. right? And because one, one thing is they have not included colonic manometry in this. They have included ma anorectal manometry. Still the ones the pressures is higher up in the you know the rectum and at the angle we don't know what is happening there so probably all these things must have influenced uh, the manometric results equally in both the groups yeah possibly possibly do you have any audience questions uh, so none as of now so uh, i think uh, uh, this will anyway intimate us so can we yeah. go to the next article, sir? Yeah, yeah can we go to the next article, sir? Yeah, thank you, sir. So the next article is uh, it got published in the this month of uh, GI endoscopy. Uh, it is titled as "Clinical Impact of Pancreatic Steatosis uh, Measured by CT on Risk of uh, Post ERCV Pancreatitis." It's a multi-center prospective trial. So we know that the post ERCP pancreatitis, it's a common and serious adverse event. Uh, average, it is around 4.5, but depending on the uh, risk of the patient and the procedure, it varies. It increases the morbidity, mortality, as well as healthcare costs in these patients. And there are many identified risk factors, both patient as well as procedural risk factors. Uh, pancreatic steatosis is a concept similar to hepatic steatosis, which, is, which means that there is fat accumulation in the pancreas. <clears throat> and it can happen in the normal aging process of a person um, and also the other risk factors being diabetes, dyslipidemia and obesity. post ERCP pancreatitis in uh, pancreatic status uh, uh, patients is possible because the tissue damage from the direct toxic effects of the pancreatic fat can lead to the uh, uh, you know damage in the uh, SNR cells. And we know that uh, certain hypertriglyceridemia in these patients they, have, they frequently present with severe pancreatitis compared to other etiologists. So, so there is some role of fat uh, in and around the pancreas to play in acute pancreatitis as well as post ERCP pancreatitis. So the idea of this study is to investigate whether pancreatic steatosis is a risk factor for post ERCP pancreatitis or not. So it's a prospective multicenter study uh, done in South Korea between 2020 to 2022. Um, all the patients, uh, consecutive patients who underwent CT scan and subsequent first-time ERCP were included. Patients who had recent acute pancreatitis, chronic pancreatitis, and those where, uh, those patients where uh, pancreatic steatosis measurement was difficult on CT were excluded, as well as in the, as well as those patients where the side wing duodenoscope could not reach the papilla. 
<coughs> ERCP was done by an experienced person and uh, wire guided cannulation was done. No rectal anesthetes were used in this population during the study period and pancreatic prophylactic pancreatic stent was used in uh, if need whenever needed. So a single uh, radiologist blinded to the clinical outcomes uh, was involved in this study wherein they have actually noted the details of pancreatic attenuation on a non contrast CT. Uh, fat is uh, uh, fat is uh, uh, you know uh, measured as negative attenuation gives ne negative attenuation values between minus 150 to minus 30 homcell units and uh, around nine areas three each in the head body and tail region were measured for pancreatic attenuation and the region of interest measured around 1 cm square details were measured close to the splenic vein and also splenic attenuation was also measured at three different places with uh, 1 cm square region of interest and it is averaged over three measurements and the ratio of pancreatic to splenic uh, fat attenuation were measured and the difference between the pancreas and spleen attenuation was also measured and it significantly correlated with the pancreatic steatosis. So previous studies have shown that the ratio of pancreatic and splenic uh, fat attenuation ratio of less than 0.7 is significant. Contrast imaging was done uh, further to detect any kind of pancreatic lesions which can affect the uh, fat accumulation in the pancreas. The primary outcome is incidence of post ERCP pancreatitis. The secondary outcomes are severity of post ERCP pancreatitis, the risk factors for total uh, post ERCP pancreatitis, as well as moderately to severe pan post ERCP pancreatitis, as well as procedural related adverse events. So, almost 786 patients uh, uh, were screened and 259 patients were excluded, and finally, 527 patients were analyzed. <coughs> And uh, there were 370 patients with no pancreatic steatosis and 157 patients with pancreatic steatosis. And all these patients, uh, after undergoing ERCP, they were evaluated for post ERCP pancreatitis based on standard definition. Uh, I'm not going into the details. And uh, around 14% uh, 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 developed post ERCP pancreatitis in the pancreatic steatosis group. And 6.2% of patients uh, develop post ERCV pancreatitis in the non steatotic group. <clears throat> so, if you see the baseline data, uh, the pancreatic steatotic group are much older, 72 years. Uh, mm, around uh, female patients were 51 in the pancreatic steatotic group. Uh, the BMI did not differ, which is more important to understand in, in contrast to the hepatic steatosis. Uh, but in uh, there is no difference between pancreatic steatotic group and no steatotic group in, with respect to BMI. And in fact, alcohol users uh, had no steatosis, 31% versus 21%. Hypertension and diabetes was more common in pancreatic steatotic, steatosis group. And uh, patients had abnormal HbA1c more in the pancreatic steatotic group as well as uh, patient had uh, lower cholesterol in the total cholesterol in the pancreatic steatotic group. Pancreatic attenuation values, if you see, 42.8 in the no steatotic group and 26.5 in the pancreatic steatotic group, which is significant. <clears throat> Overall, 30% had uh, pancreatic steatosis in the study group and um, post ERCV pancreatitis developed in 8.5 and 14% in the pancreatic steatotic group developed post ERCV pancreatitis and 6.2% of non steatotic group had post TRCV pancreatitis, which is severe. But uh, the severity of pancreatitis was similar in both the steatotic and non steatotic group. And other uh, parameter, other adverse events or parameters like bleeding or length of hospital stay were similar in both the groups. <coughs> so if you see uh, <coughs> the univariate and multivariate analysis, in the univariate group, the double guide wire method, pancreatic opacification, with contrast and pancreatic synchrotomy had higher odds in developing uh, post ERCV pancreatitis. Uh, but if multivariate analysis was included, only pancreatic steatosis group had uh, uh, higher risk, was shown to have higher risk for post ERCV pancreatitis. 2.09 odds ratio after multivariate analysis. <coughs> so pancreatic steatosis is a strong and unique risk factor for development of post ERCV pancreatitis but it did not correlate with its severity. Pancreatic steatosis, the risk factors being diabetes, dyslipidemia, advancing age, older men, females, and also patients with visceral obesity. So the possible mechanisms laid, laid down were uh, adipocytes can store and release the fatty acids 
thereby it can stimulate the secretion of various pro inflammatory metabolites cytokines chemokines and adipocytes adipokines there is a two hit theory uh, mentioned in this article probably there is a pancreatic steatosis which is first hit you have done an ercp and uh, there can be a release of uh, inflammatory cytokines which is second hit leading to post ercp pancreatitis <clears throat> there can be high levels of local unsaturated fatty acids which can induce local injury and peri snr fat necrosis as well as systemic fat inflammation so the strengths of this study are uh, ct scan was used which is most commonly available worldwide for assessment of pancreatic steatosis and uh, a uniform pancreatic steatosis measurement was attempted by choosing nine region of interest in the pancreas and three region of interest in the spleen and also p by s ratio was assessed but the limitations are there is no histological data available to assess the fat content in the pancreas which is logistically and ethically it may, may, may be very difficult uh, to assess and the intra and inter observer variability is not assessed uh, the p by s cut off was not defined or validated but less than 0.7 is used in this study based on previous uh, reports uh we don't know uh, the current therapeutic implications for this pancreatic steatosis and uh, what is the applicability to countries outside korea is still not known the the only thing is that uh, basically we come we know that pancreatic steatosis appears to be a risk factor for post ercp pancreatitis development at least in korean population and um, at least if this is identified as a high risk in these patients we should consider alternative therapeutic approaches um uh, and also consider uh, post ercp pancreatitis especially like rectal indomethacin or nsaids because in this study uh, rectal nsaids were not uh, used <coughs> thank you comment sir so dr chalapati that pancreatic steatosis is it exactly similar like associated with metabolic syndrome like fatty liver disease so they have uh, uh, noted that diabetes and dyslipidemia might be higher in these patients uh, and also obesity as per previous reports uh, but still uh, you know like in liver we clearly don't have um histological data to prove that uh, the fat attenuation values uh, measured on ct reflect the you know the uh, fat content on biopsy so in both the groups there are many factors which might predict the risk of uh, post ercp pancreatitis but in this study they have shown that in the multivariate analysis only pancreatic steatosis is significant yeah but both the groups there might be many other variables many other many other uh, variables true true many other variables so, <coughs> probably but, uh, you know the number of patients included might not be enough or it is not it is only a single center study still uh, you know they could not get any uh, positive result on multivariate analysis uh, pertaining to other risk factors but in both the groups you have shown that the severity does not differ severe pancreatitis yes. is similar in both the groups yes yes only the mild pancreatitis is more but yes. severe pancreatitis is similar yes yes Yes. I think we need more study on this. Hmm. So we need to understand, like pancreatic stasis is how it behaves, and we need more study. Yes. But there is a study which showed that this is a risk factor of pancreatitis. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So as in this study, uh, majority of patients have biliary stones. Uh, so how? Uh, because if there is any primary pancreatic pathology, it might also affect uh, fat accumulation in the pancreas per se. but at least in patients common indications like the malignant biliary uh, stricture or benign biliary stricture or bile duct stones uh, if you look uh, keep seeing at the pancreas probably ask your radiologist what is the fat attenuation uh, try to identify in your own cohort of patients and see the follow up probably that is the message yes. yeah interesting study chalpati uh, yes. and it raises another important question of so called idiopathic acute pancreatitis does pancreatic steatosis contribute to that also mm. and id mm. yeah id ideally probably a prior ct done in these patients for some other reason and then on follow up if they develop 
uh, you know pancreatitis without any other risk factor uh, you know matching with all the probable other etiological factors uh, that would have that would be an ideal study but uh, for that we need a careful follow up of those patients who didn't have uh, pancreatitis before no other risk factors that might help because if we start assessing these patients after episode of pancreatitis probably uh, you know during healing process or degeneration process there can be fat accumulation by itself yeah so 25 years ago uh, hepatic steatosis was considered to be a very benign kind of thing mm-hmm. and people never gave it a lot of thought it was uh, considered that it, it doesn't uh, it happens because of obesity but now we are seeing the epidemic of nephrol related now muscle related mm-hmm. chronic hepatitis and cirrhosis so i think it's a very interesting thing uh, the only problem is you have a very good ultrasound to just detect uh, hepatic steatosis but pancreas being a retroperitoneal organ so your uh, common garden radiological investigations may not pick pa- pancreatic steatosis so you need to go for ultrasound those patients are undergoing eus So, do we have any data on EOS detection of pancreatic steatosis? Any studies could you come come across? With the ME three, with ME three, we can detect some this cap value and this thing. I think, but the the visceral fat is always considered as metabolically active since that, and if it need metabolically active, that means it has a tendency to develop to develop into cytokine storm, and that. was shown during covid pandemic also that, that many patients who are obese they develop severe disease and there is some literature available uh, for patients having developing acute pancreatitis the risk of having severe complication of pancreatitis increases with with visceral obesity yeah so this study is in the same line but they have not reached to the level of severity that there is a higher incidence but the severity of pancreatitis is still equal in both groups and we actually within we do not know about the severity of pancreatic steatosis in this case we do not have yes. any grading system grading for- is not there yeah yes yes and so, histology again histology is something that i mean i mean unlike the liver histology is easily available here again we don't know so interesting interesting field probably will develop in next next decade yeah <laughs> yeah right. a good study to develop okay yes sir uh, Uh, nowadays, uh, you might be seeing also many ultrasound reports. They are they are writing uh, fatty pancreas. So, mm-hmm. so yes. that means ultrasound also they are able to see that uh, features, and yeah. they are reporting also fatty pancreas. You might be seeing reports nowadays. Yeah, yeah. We 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 are seeing randomly, sir. Definitely fatty pancreas. Uh, we have come across couple of reports. Uh, we investigated them with CT and then on MILS lipase. Majority of them, I mean, almost all of them, they are asymptomatic. They got uh, you know uh, uh, ultrasound for some other reason, not not related to pain or investigation of pain. So we are seeing. Uh, the only thing is uh, in a transabdominal ultrasound, you have other organs to compare, like uh, kidney, for example. A right kidney, you compare it with when you are imaging the liver. so you compare it with that and then say whether there is a fatty liver on or not you add uh, you know kind of fibro scan or ultrasound fat quantification further to quantify it but if you take uh, ultrasound for pancreas transabdominal probably retroperitoneal organ it is difficult if the patient is obese it is difficult but coming to eus again uh, probably you need to start comparing uh, in non pancreatic cases when you are doing it for other non pancreatic indications compare yeah. it with the left kidney at least uh, look at body and tail region see see that but at the same time you need to be very sure to differentiate between the pancreatic plane and the peripancreatic plane sometimes uh, you know it might be very difficult uh, unlike in ct uh, because fat, fat being a hyperechoic uh, structure you tend to see only the duct and some amount of parenchyma and then you report as parenchymal atrophy but you don't consider the probably the thin chunk of fat tissue which is surrounding that pancreatic parenchyma it may be a fat atrophy or a peripancreas we don't know right. so uh, so i think we 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 did the study uh, looking at uh, 
I mean, non-pancreatic endoscopic ultrasound and looking for pancreatic findings in them. And we presented this two years back at ESG days. And uh, I mean, we looked largely for uh, findings of chronic pancreatitis and uh, we found that up to 6% of patients actually had typical features like chronic pancreatitis uh, on patient on, I mean, even if they're undergoing EOS for a non-pancreatic indication, something else, lymph node or whatever. Uh, so I guess something like that, wherein you can actually incorporate looking for a fat measurement also, like Nitin is suggesting, maybe we can, we can look at that and uh, something like that can be done and, you know, taken forward prospectively. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so, Pudhi, there's a question in chat box, like yeah. you know, MRI, PDF for fatty liver. Is there <clears throat> something for fatty pancreas? I think people have tried, sir. Some of the reports are there, but it is still not yet quantified and no definitions are there. The main problem is there is no, you know, histological standard, gold standard to compare the value. That is the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another question actually says, is EUS more sensitive than CT? I think, uh, uh, I think we already addressed that. Uh, yeah. And will acute pancreatitis in the recent past replicate as pancreatic steatosis and can pancreatic steatosis be considered a risk factor for acute pancreatitis of unknown etiology? I think uh, Chalapati already alluded to that. Yeah. Uh, yes. sir just discussed about it. Yes. 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 So maybe there's already an increase. <coughs> Lastly, any reason uh, being given for not opting for rectal NSAID? Uh, with this background, I mean, uh, it's a trial design. So, <laughs> nowhere actually in, in the trial is it mentioned why they've not used the rectal NSA? No, they, I, not. they have mentioned that it's not available in Korea. Ah, they, they, it's 